Anyone not ready? <laughs> Everyone ready? Okay, good. So uh, let us continue. Uh, you have changed the seating to get ready for more meditation practice. Is that right? <laughs> get ready for tomorrow. Okay, that's good. Okay, so we are going to have a look at, not straight away, but in a second we will have a look at the a small part of the Mahaparinibbana Sutta, which is the Buddha's passing away. So we had a look at his early life, his enlightenment, a few things about the things he did while he was alive, and then his final passing away. So you get a kind of a broad outlook over the whole of the Buddha's life. Uh, but before we do that, uh, there's a couple of more uh, kind of short anecdotes, if you like, short little stories of the Buddha's life that I thought would be nice to have a quick look at. And the first one here is from the Vinaya Pitaka. That's why the, it sounds a bit funny. It says that Chivara Kandaka, Chivara Kandaka is the chapter on robes in the Vinaya. Uh, in the Vinaya, the Vinaya is the monastic rules, uh, yeah, and also the uh, regulations for monastics. Not just rules, but regulations in the sense that uh, it lays down how the sangha operates together, how it makes decisions, uh, how. Uh, ordination procedures happen, all these kind of things. Uh, and this one here, this translation here, is actually my, this is actually my translation, because I have translated pretty much the whole Vinaya Pitaka. So this is, uh, com comes directly from me, which is kind of nice, isn't it? Uh, <laughs> I get a chance to showcase my, a little bit of my own translation, which is good. Uh. So this is a story from there, and the interesting thing about the Vinaya is that uh, it has obviously a lot of rules, but also quite a large number of stories as well. Uh, it's in the Vinaya you find the story of Visaka uh, and how she was a, a strong disciple of the Buddha. Another Pindika story is found in the Vinaya. The famous story of Jivaka, the Buddha's doctor, uh, is found in the Vinaya. Lots of interesting stories like that. And of course, many of these are stories, uh, and it's hard to know how literally to take them. Uh, some of it is likely to be true, uh, yeah, and some of it is likely to be more mythological. Uh. But this little story here, I think, is quite likely to be uh, true to reality. There's nothing really exaggerated about it. Uh, it seems quite real in many ways, and this is why it is interesting. Uh. This is called the story of the one who was sick. At one time, a monk who had dysentery uh, was living, uh, was lying in his own feces and urine. Uh. Just then, as the master was walking about the dwellings with Venerable Ananda as his attendant, he came to this monk. When he saw his condition, he approached him and said, What is your sickness, monk? I have dysentery, master. Uh, but don't you have a nurse? No. Why don't the monks nurse you? Uh, because I don't do anything for them. The master said to Ananda, Go and get some water, Ananda. Let's wash this monk. Yes, Venerable Sir, and he did so. Then the master poured the water while Ananda cleaned him up. Afterwards, the master lifted him by the head and Ananda by the feet, and they put him on a bed. So, um, this is quite, quite unusual. Here again you have the founder of a religion, uh, and uh, he, one of his monks, one of his disciples gets sick, uh, and then he goes there and he cleans him up, he washes him up. Uh, and dysentery is obviously quite a foul and quite a, a disgusting illness in many ways, uh, and uh, still the Buddha kind of uh, uh, gets down and helps Venerable Ananda to wash him up and clean him up in this way. Uh, it's quite remarkable. Uh, and I think this is, uh, to me, this is one of those signs of a true spiritual leader. Uh, you're not just a teacher, uh, you don't just tell other people what to do. Uh, obviously you live what you teach. Uh, and this is what the Buddha really is doing here. Uh, and uh, sometimes we, I think we try to, as Buddhists, we try to elevate the Buddha up in the wrong way, uh, as some kind of untouchable, unapproachable spiritual leader. Uh, uh, but so for that reason, it's sometimes good, I think, to see these little stories uh, where the Buddha comes across as very human, not only human, but uh, human in a way that I think we all would agree that a great spiritual leader should practice as they speak. As they speak, that sh so they should act. As they act, so they should speak. Yeah. So, uh, and there's a, this, uh, yeah. 
Soon afterwards, the master had the order of monks assembled and questioned them. Is there a sick monk in that dwelling? Yes, master. What is his sickness? He has dysentery. Does he have a nurse? No. But why don't you nurse him? Because he doesn't do anything for us. <laughs> it's like a business deal, yeah? Okay, you act for us and we will nurse you in return. So you better, you know, store up some good merit and good karma, otherwise you're not going to get a nurse when you get sick. But um, it shouldn't really be like that, because what does it mean to do anything in Buddhism? If you live your monastic life well and you practice appropriately, uh, then that is really the main job of a monastic anyway, yeah, to make sure your meditation goes well. Uh, and then you're doing a lot just through the, your ability to attain these states. Uh, uh, of meditation and for gaining insight and understanding of the Dhamma. That is what the real practice is about anyway. So if you get, got that, surely you deserve to be nursed. So I think the attitude here is obviously something a little bit wrong with the attitude of these monks. So, and so the Buddha replies, Monks, you have no mother or father to nurse you. If you don't nurse each other, who will? Whoever would nurse me should nurse those who are sick. So if you want to if you if you if the Buddha was sick and you would help nursing, yeah, then you should help nurse any of the other monks or nuns, presumably. Yeah. So uh, it's a beautiful little statement there of the importance of nursing each other and helping each other. If you have a preceptor, yeah, he should nurse you for life. He should not go anywhere until you have recovered. Yeah. Poor Ajahn Brahm, he has so many disciples. Yeah, I. He's my preceptor, so if I, get, if I get really sick, then he has to look after me here. <laughs> That's what it says here. <laughs> if you have a teacher, uh, he should nurse you for life. He should not go anywhere until you have recovered. If you have a student, he should nurse you for life. I also have to look after Adam Brahm, yeah, as it go goes both ways. If you have a student, he should nurse you for life. He should not go anywhere until you have recovered. If you have a pupil, uh, uh, he should nurse you for life. He should not go anywhere until you have covered. If you have a co-student, uh, like in, this means that you have the same teacher. A co-student is like if you're both disciples of Ajahn Brahm, then you are co-students. He should nurse you for life. He should not go anywhere until you have recovered. If you have a co-pupil, he should nurse you for life. He should not go anywhere until you have recovered. If you have none of these, uh, the order should nurse you. Uh, the Sangha should nurse you. Uh, if you do not nurse one who is sick, you commit an offense of wrong conduct. Is that, is that something bad going on here? Okay, good. Yeah, problem fixed at least for now. So, um, so that is just a very tiny little sutta, which I, it's not really a sutta; it's just a part of a big chapter, yeah, just to give you some feeling again for what the Buddha was like in practice. Sometimes, uh, one of the nice things about the Vinaya Pitaka is that you get to see the monastic sangha and sometimes the lay people in real situations. Uh, yeah, this is actually real. This is not kind of made up. It's not. It's not always inspiring. The suttas are, tend to be very inspiring because you get all the arahants together giving teachings and all is, everything is very high, polluting and a very kind of, wow, really amazing, a lot of the teachings. And that, that is why sometimes people kind of get worried. Yeah, in those days everybody was arahants. So what, <laughs> what chance have we got to, to get there when everyone in those days was so spiritually advanced compared to what they are now? And sometimes you get a bit... Uh, if you feel as if you can't measure up fully to the standards of that time. But when you read the Vinaya, you get the opposite feeling. Uh, you get this feeling that, wow, in those days people were just as bad as they are now. Sometimes worse. Sometimes worse they are th than they are now. People, uh, people are always the same. This is the interesting thing. Uh, you read the Vinaya, you see the kind of things the monastics were doing, and you sometimes you shake your head in disbelief uh, at how they can be doing such stupid things. Uh, yeah, it really is over the top sometimes. Uh, but the right way of thinking about that is just to remember that human nature is pretty constant across time and across cultures. Basically, it's almost always the same. And uh, 
th so the veneer sometimes gives you a feeling that yeah, well if those scallywags could do it, uh, then surely I can I can do it as well. Uh, yeah, this is kind of the <laughs> advantage of reading the veneer. So it has a more, it's more realistic in many ways. Uh, the na true human nature comes out. And here also in the story sometimes also it is re quite realistic. And here is one of those realistic stories uh, of the Buddha himself. Okay, let's go on to the next one. And this is uh, uh, just another dis very short description of the Buddha. And one of the reasons I thought of reading out this one is that sometimes the way the Buddha is described is sometimes uh, exaggerated. So for example in the Mahaparinibbana Sutta towards the very end uh, the Buddha is given a golden robe. He puts on the golden robe and then Ananda says, wow your skin is even more golden than the golden robe. <laughs> is, that, is that realistic? Who, who has skin that is so golden, that is more golden than a golden robe? It's kind of, I've never seen anyone like that. So even if you are a Buddha, it sounds over the top. But more so, the Buddha is getting old now. Huh? Yeah, he's getting really old and uh, uh, when the older you get, the less, kind of the more your skin tends to wrinkle and it tends to get blotched and all these kind of things as you get older. So the less golden it should be as you get older, it shouldn't get more golden. Even if it is close to the time of uh, the final passing away, it seems a bit strange. And this sutta here is just to show you that the Buddha, basically, he was like everyone else. He also suffered from the problems of old age. This is Adan Sujato's translation. So, so I have heard at one time the Buddha was staying near Savati in the eastern monastery, in the stilt longhouse of Megara's mother. Then in the late afternoon the Buddha came out of retreat and sat warming his back in the last rays of the sun. He has kind of thing you can imagine an old person doing. An old person is cold perhaps and you sit down and you warm your back in the last rays of the sun. Then Venerable Ananda went up to the Buddha bowed and while massaging the Buddha's limbs he said it's incredible sir it's amazing how the complexion of your skin is no longer pure and bright your limbs are flaccid and wrinkled and your body is stooped and it's apparent that there has been a de deterioration in your faculties of eye ear nose tongue and body yeah, that his eyes are deteriorating, he can't see as clearly as he did before, his hearing is probably going. Typical things that you expect of old age. Everyone has these problems uh, when they become old. And then the Buddha replies, that's how it is, Ananda. When young, you are liable to grow old. When healthy, you are liable to get sick. And when you are alive, you are liable to die. The complexion of the skin is no longer pure and bright. The limbs are flaccid and wrinkled, uh, and the body is stooped. And it's apparent that there has been a deterioration in the faculties of eye, ear, nose, tongue, and body. Uh. That is what the Buddha said. Uh, and the Holy One, the teacher, went on to say, uh, Curse this wretched old age. I'm, I'm not sure if he said that. I'm not sure about this. But anyway, <laughs> curse this wretched old age. Uh, uh, which makes you so ugly. That's how much this delightful puppet uh, is ground down by old age. Uh, even if you live for a hundred years, uh, you'll still end up dying. Death spares no one. It crushes all underfoot. So, uh, there you are, the reality of life. Uh, yeah, and uh, I hope I'm not giving you too much reality uh, sometimes. Uh, sometimes too much reality uh, can, be, uh, can be kind of um, hard to take sometimes. You have to be ready about it, uh, ready for it. Uh, but I'm sure you are ready for it. I'm just, uh, uh, it. But it's good to see these things. Again, it gives you, I think, a very realistic picture of the Buddha, a human being like everyone else, uh, with the same typical human problems as anyone else. Uh. So now I'm going to go on to the Maha uh, Parinibbana Sutta. And uh, this is one of the great suttas in the Pali Canon. It's the longest sutta by far. It is over 60 pages in the Pali. And that is uh, include, that ha is, uh, when it has lots of contractions. Yeah? If we took out all the contractions and filled everything thing in, it would probably be 200 pages long or something. Yeah? It would be really, really long. Yeah? So this is the sutta in the... Um, 
uh, the longest sutta, and it's not really a sutta, uh, the Mahapanibbana Sutta, because a sutta is usually like one occasion where the Buddha gives a teaching. Uh, but this is not like this is not one occasion. This is a long story uh, when the Buddha starts off in Rajagaha in Magadha with King Ajatasattu, the famous story there, uh, and then he, all his travels through India until eventually he ends up in Kushinara. Uh, for those of you who have been in India, you will know know these places. Yeah, and it's a long way from Rajagaha even now, even now. We travel by bus, even by bus is a long way, especially in India, it's a long way by bus, but uh, <laughs> it's a long way, uh, and this is where he walked, and it took months, yeah, and this is the story of the uh, Mahaparinibbana Sutta, and what is so interesting about the story is that it is mostly narrative, it is mostly a story, and interspersed in that narrative uh, you have little teachings. Uh, so you get a wide variety of teachings. Uh, but also because it is a story you actually get a lot of historical context. Uh, and it's quite interesting to read that historical context, also geographical context, the various places in ancient India. Uh, and you read that and, and, and you can compare that with uh, the few facts that we know about ancient Indian history uh, and it's actually very interesting uh, because it gives you a feeling for that history in ancient India. This is one of those documents that give you uh, a little bit of historical information. Uh. So um, for this reason it's very interesting and it's really worthwhile an in-depth study and I have done that uh, uh, online uh, and I'm still kind of going through it uh, at least to the my own abilities of course I'm I don't, exp I don't I'm not really a sup you know a, a, a great scholar in the sense of an academic in this I only rely on my own studies in this uh, but I have done a, a fair amount of studies so it's probably a little bit more helpful than most people at least uh, uh, so that is the um, what this story is about, very beautiful. And what is so powerful about it is that the Buddha knows that he is about to pass away. And because he knows that he is about to pass away, coming to the end of his life, he lays down all of those things that are necessary for the Sangha and for the uh, community to function after his passing away. So he tells them how to operate without him. He tells them what is the essence of his teachings. He tells them how to resolve problems and things in the community. All of these things are part of the sutta, and this is one reason why it is so uh, interesting. And it, you know, the Buddha says the criteria, for example, for keeping Buddhism alive in the future, those criteria are laid down in the sutta. So all of that is very interesting. I'm, I'm not going to focus on all of that now because it's obviously way too much. Uh, we'd have to have another retreat just to look at the whole sutta, basically. Uh, should, can we have another retreat? Maybe we can. Eh? <laughs> Bobby, where are you? There you are. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, but maybe one of these uh, one of these lifetimes we can do that. Uh, yeah, we'll see <laughs> see what happens. Uh, but um, yeah. So now we're going to focus on the very last part, which is mostly about the Buddha personal. There's a few things in there as well, which are not about the Buddha as such, but more general things about how how we should do things after he he passes away. Yeah. And one of the great and important themes of the Mahaparinibbana Sutta that makes it into like almost like an epic and something very special is of course this kind of feeling that the Buddha is about to pass away. Uh, something enormous is about to happen. Uh, and this is uh, of course what it really does. It is a uh, uh, it cho it um, talk it's about impermanence, yeah. It's about anicca because uh, Buddha's passing away is one of those moments where you really feel impermanence very powerfully. Uh. I mentioned this before here a few days ago about the f imagine having the most powerful spiritual teacher in the world, uh, someone that you have relied on for four decades to tell you what to do, uh, give you the most powerful teachings, uh, someone you can always go to if there's something, argument or a problem in the community who will resolve the issues for you. Uh, he's like a father for everyone. Uh, and then he dies. Uh, Imagine the gap, the hole in the Sangha, yeah, it's very difficult to deal with. Uh, and this is, uh, so this idea of impermanence is a very powerful thing here. Uh, uh, and that's why he says to Ananda, everything that is dear and pleasing to you must become otherwise, uh, must, uh, 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 must pass away or whatever it is. Uh. So this is a very important part of this. And it's even when you just read this story, uh, you get almost sometimes a bit sad the Buddha's passing away just by reading it, uh, let alone being there, you can imagine, would have been far more powerful. Uh. So that is just a little bit by way of background. Uh, 
So let us now have a, a look at this. So this is the very uh, last chapter of the Mahaparinibbana Sutta. It is divided into six uh, sub-chapters. Uh, and this is uh, coming to the, is it the sixth or the fifth? Maybe it's the fifth part. I think it's the fifth part of the Sutta, actually. And it's not the full, but it's part of the fifth part. And uh, the Buddha has now walked all the way through India from Rajagaha to Kusinara. And now he's just about... Uh, to come to Kusinara. This is where this starts, this particular part of it. Uh. Then the Buddha said to Ananda, Come Ananda, let's go to the far shore of the Golden River uh, and on to the Sal forest uh, of the Malas at Upavattana near Kusinara. Yes sir, Ananda replied, and that's where they went. Uh. Then the Buddha addressed Ananda, Please Ananda, set up a cot a cot is like a mobile bed or something, for me between the twin sal trees, with my head to the north. I am tired and I will lie down. Yes, sir, replied Ananda, and did as he was asked. And then the Buddha lay down in the lion's posture on the right side, placing one foot on top of the other, mindful and aware. Now, um, uh, so here the Buddha is kind of is interesting. The little things here are interesting, like, uh, 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 for example, that he, his head is to the north. Why is his head to the north? <laughs> it's, it's one of those strange things. Sometimes you read the suttas uh, and there are little details like that. You know, sometimes the Buddha, for example, he enters a house and he sits down, uh, and usually he would sit down, I think, against the eastern wall, uh, and then he will facing the west. I think that's usually how it is. Uh. And uh, because of that, if you go to a monastery, uh, the Buddha statue will often be against the eastern wall, facing west. Uh, yeah? <laughs> so uh, it's it, interesting how little details like this in the sutta have made their way into Buddhist culture. Uh. And in Buddhist culture you can recognize many of these things that you find here. Uh. And uh, the more you know about the suttas and the more you know about Buddhist culture, uh, the more of the little details that you can see in monasteries, uh, you can see in the conduct of monastics, uh, you can see where it all comes from. It stems from the early suttas. Uh, like not pointing the Buddha towards, uh, the bu the pointing your feet towards the Buddha, for example, or even to a monastic. Uh, that comes straight from the Vinaya Pitaka. A lot of that. Uh, Buddhist culture is ve very heavily influenced uh, by the early suttas. Uh. So this is maybe what is happening here as well. The Buddha is uh, facing north. It means that when he lies down on the right side, then you will be facing west. Yeah, so this could be another f facing west thing. I don't, don't know why that is the case. There may have been something about the local culture at the time that facing west was right. Or maybe uh, it was because the sun was going down in the evening so that people could see him properly. I have no idea. It's just speculation, really. Yeah. But. Uh, it's strange that these things are mentioned at all, as if they are important somehow. If it wasn't important, it wouldn't have been mentioned, but nobody really explains why. Then he lies down in the lion's posture. On the right side, yeah, placing one foot on top of the other. Uh, you may have seen this in the typical the Buddha statues uh, that are from the Parinibbana. You will see the lion's posture, uh, the Buddha lying exactly like that. Uh, if you go to the uh, Parinibbana temple in Kushinara today, there's a ba massive statue of the Buddha lying in the lion's posture, yeah, with his head uh, on his uh, his arm and then uh, uh, leg upon leg on the other side. Uh, and uh, you will find it's quite common today for monastics to try to sleep in that posture uh, because it was that's how the Buddha supposed to have been lying down. So it's kind of the precedent for everyone else to uh, lie down in the same way. Uh. Uh, but what is interesting about this one, uh, uh, and this is the thing that uh, is not obvious if you, unless you know how this usually is phrased. Uh, usually it is phrased, he was mindful and fully aware, uh, having made the uh, having given up, the having given rise to the perception of rising up again. Huh? Yeah, that's usually the, the, how this is phrased. So usually, when the Buddha lies down, he has a clear perception about when he's going to rise up again afterwards. Uh, yeah, it's like when you lie down in the evening and you want to get up at a certain time, you make a strong determination and then you wake up at that time. Uh, and the Buddha would always do that. Uh, but you see, here it's missing. Uh, yeah, this not, doesn't say there that the Buddha made a kind of a perception of rising again afterwards. Uh, 
And when you know the context, it's obvious, because this is the last time he lies down. He's not going to rise up again. Yeah? So this is kind of, here you see the Parinibbana coming. He's lying down for the last time. No perception of rising up again. Yeah? And in one of the parallels to this sutta, I think it's the Sarvastivadin parallel found in Sanskrit, uh, it actually says that uh, here he lies down, giving rise to the perception of Nibbana. Yeah, not of rising up, but of Nibbana, because he knows that next thing ha happening now is Nibbana, so that is the perception that he gives rise to. Uh, I don't know, is that really required? Do you need to have the perception of Nibbana? I think Nibbana is going to happen anyway, I don't think there's any, you need to do that, but, or, or maybe it is required, I don't know, but uh, uh, I suspect it is just something that has been added to make it more complete and more parallel to the ordinary version. Uh, anyway, little things, I hope these little things uh, interest you a little bit at least, if not then um, then uh, I don't know, then I'm not sure what, what happens then. <laughs> So, uh, let's ca carry on. Now, at that time, the twin sal trees were in full blossom with flowers out of season. They sprinkled and bestrewed the realized one's body in honor of the realized one. And the flowers of the heavenly flame tree fell from the sky, and they too sprinkled and bestrewed the realized one's body in honor of the realized one. The heavenly sandalwood powder fell from the sky, and it too sprinkled and bestrewed the realized one's body in honor of the realized one. And the heavenly music played in the sky in honor of the realized one. And the heavenly choirs sang in the sky in honor of the realized one. Did this really happen? <laughs> it's one of those questions. It sounds a bit over the top. We're not used to heavenly flowers falling on the ground, it's kind of, it's, it's, it does sound a bit extraordinary. And um, I, I think it's interesting to look at this, did it really happen or not? And one of the things that is fascinating about the Mahaparinibbana Sutta is that uh, as you come closer and closer to uh, the Buddha's final passing away, uh, time is kind of dragged out. Uh, yeah? More and more details are put in there. Uh, the days, we get full of little details. Everything is described in minute details, as if people are afraid of the Buddha's passing away. Uh, they want to drag out the time with as much detail as possible. Uh, the closer you get, and then you have the last of this, the last of that, the last time he looked at Vesali, the last time he, uh, uh, like his last meal, yeah, the last time he lies down, you see now, and it's kind of, this is one of the things that you see in the Mahipanibbana Sutta, as if people are afraid, the Buddha is going to pass away. No, dr please drag out the time, put in more details. It's interesting. The other thing that happens as the Buddha comes closer to his death, you get more and more wonders, marvels. We might call it miracles, except that in Buddhism we don't really have miracles, but call them wonders and marvels. More and more of that comes as you get close to the death. And uh, the feeling is that someone is, this hasn't been written by the Buddha, yeah, obviously not. This is a narrative, this is a story, been added by other people afterwards. Uh, and the feeling again is this feeling you have that people are trying to remember this with faith, adding details, uh, yeah, that people, they're probably not lying, it's just that they're allowing their imagination to kind of run riot a little bit and kind of to overthink the situation and add things. And I see this all the time in the Buddhist community here, where people see things that aren't really there. People think that a, a certain monk is reading their mind. This happens all the time. And then I go to the monk and say, well, did you read the mind? They said, no, of course not. Yeah, this is, happens all the time because we put things into the situation that actually isn't there. And this is so common, and this is bound to happen when the Buddha is passing away. You can imagine these things happening because everybody wants to remember it in a positive way. So you add things, yeah? Things get more and more miraculous. And for this reason, the Mahaparinibbana Sutta can, should be really be viewed as not just history, but as also partially as legend and mythology at the same time. It is the beginning of the legend of the Buddha, not just the history of the Buddha, but also the legend of the Buddha at the same time. This is, uh, I think, an important thing to realize. This uh, doesn't uh, mean that uh, you know, we should discount everything out of hand. Sometimes there are truly amazing things happen in the world, and that's fine, but we should also be realistic about what is going on. There's no point in believing in all kinds of uh, s things that are uh, you know, clearly 
uh, not ha didn't happen, there's no point in kind of believing in nonsense and becoming superstitious, that there's no point in that. Uh, we want to be realistic about this. Uh, so how can we be realistic about this? And as always, the way, the wha how to uh, go about checking this is to compare it to other versions of the same sutta. And fortunately we have quite a few versions of the Mahaparinibbana Sutta available. We have one version in Sanskrit. We have several versions in ancient Chinese language. Uh, yeah, and one of those in ancient Chinese has been translated into English, which is uh, good for me because I can't read any ancient Chinese. Uh, so I have three versions I can check against. Uh, and uh, quite interesting is that the version in Sanskrit, I think that's the one, this particular passage is quite different. Uh, all it says in that passage is that the uh, salt trees were, uh, they were blooming out of season. Uh, that's all it says, and they, and they shed their bloom on the Buddha. That's all it says. There was nothing about the heavenly flowers, uh, nothing about the heavenly sandalwood, heavenly music, heavenly choirs. Uh, all of that is missing. Uh. So that then it gets much more realistic already. Yeah, okay, a tree is flowering out of season. Sometimes trees actually do flower out of season. So that's possible, at least is in w within the realms of what we are used to. Uh, and uh, so uh, I take that to be the earlier version, and then the su more supernatural elements are likely to have been added later on by overly zealous disciples trying to kind of make it make it more magnificent and more powerful. Uh, and we find this throughout the Mahaparinibbana Sutta, in fact, across the suttas in general, uh, that the more uh, supernormal elements uh, tend to be uh, very uh, unreliable, uh, in that they often exist in one version, but not in another version of the same sutta. Whereas the core doctrinal teachings of the Buddha, you know, the gradual training and all this kind of stuff, this actually is there very consistently across between the suttas. Uh, that's very interesting and it shows you the di distinction between teachings of the Buddha and narrative elements that were added by later uh, redactors. Uh. So that's how I read this, but please don't take my word as final. This is just me and this is my kind of uh, uh, kind of skeptical way perhaps, you know, of, of, l of reading these things. Uh. And uh, there may very well be other ways of looking at this thing as well. So don't necessarily think that this is the final word. Uh, all, we, all we can ever hope to do is to get reasonably close to the truth, the absolute truth. There's no way we're going to be able to go back two and a half thousand years. Uh, and we don't really need that as long as we have the Dhamma uh, reasonably well uh, uh, transmitted. Uh. Then the Buddha pointed out to Ananda what was happening, adding, that's not how the realized one is honored, respected, revered, venerated, and esteemed. Yeah, so all these heavenly beings, they're wasting their time. Yeah, venerating and revering by throwing down flowers and sandalwood, etc. Any monk or nun or male or female lay follower who practices in line with the teachings, practicing properly, living in line with the teachings, they honor, respect, revere, venerate, and esteem the realized one with the highest honor. So, Ananda, you should train like this, which are practice in line with the teachings, practicing properly, living in line with the teaching. Well, this is very interesting, and I think very important, uh, uh, because we often forget this, uh, or, or if we look around the Buddhist world and what Buddhist people do, uh, a lot of what people do is just rituals, yeah? They do this kind of stuff. They put out, they light the incense and light the candles and then they do some chanting uh, and then they are kind of happy with that, yeah? And that's how far the Buddhist practice goes. Very, very common in the Buddhist world, just like it is in any other religion, yeah? All religions cannot turn out to be the same in a sense. Uh, but the Buddha says, forget about that, that's the wrong way. You don't actually even venerate the Buddha that way. Huh? Yeah, you, don't, you, you know, you're putting out candles, you don't actually do anything for the Buddha by doing that. Huh? So, uh, and that shows you that all these empty rituals, really, they have no place in Buddhism. This is what I was saying before, if you're going to do a ritual, huh, do it in a way whereby the ritual has meaning for you. Huh? 
yeah, where it feels good. And sometimes it does feel good to do a little ritual. So yeah, you, when you light some candles, you create a nice atmosphere. You maybe uh, light some good incense, and you get a nice kind of atmosphere again. Uh, you bow down because actually bowing down feels very nice when you bow down to the Buddha. You're bowing down to something really worthy of being respected. That feels good. Uh, and if these things feel good, uh, and they give rise to wholesome states of mind, then they are great. So know how to do rituals. This is part of the thing here. A very important message, I think, for our modern world to remember uh, this particular advice by the Buddha. So uh, the way to do it is to practice. When we practice the teachings, that is when we are honoring the Buddha. Why is that? And the reason for that is because, uh, remember, the Buddha teaches out of compassion. Uh, he teaches because he wants us to be happy. Uh, he teaches because he want us to, wants us to get the results of the practice. That's why he teaches. Uh, he doesn't teach to get followers. Uh, he doesn't teach to get cups of coffee, uh, even. <laughs> even though I got one, which, is, which actually is very nice, but uh, he doesn't teach for any of the material things in the world, or for honor or any of this. He teaches simply out of compassion to make us as happy as possible. And if we waste that opportunity, if we don't take it, he will be disappointed. He says, do like this, you will be happy. And we say, no, I'd rather just light the incense. Then he won't be too, <laughs> he won't be too pleased. You can imagine, it's, it's kind of a bit heartbreaking, because he's given you all the formula for being happy, but you don't get it. And it's the same thing I know with Ajahn Brahm. Ajahn Brahm, he is the most happy when his disciples get results. Uh, yeah, in the meditation practice, they have a nice meditation. It's wonderful to hear people having a nice meditation, getting results from the practice. It really lifts you up, yeah? Especially a teacher like Ajahn Brahm, who has uh, focused on meditation so much and on the samad and all of these kind of things. Uh, that's why he teaches. Uh, so remember that. So when you tell Ajahn Brahm about, uh, you know, tell, us, tell him over something positive about your practice. Uh, yeah, oh, it's, my practice is going well. Then he will be, feel good about it. Uh, that's the right way of uh, uh, paying back uh, your, if you like, if you, have a, if you feel you have a debt of gratitude or whatever, then that's the right way of paying it back by uh, uh, saying something like that. Uh, so uh, that is the. Uh, a very important teaching. You can see here how the Buddha is summarizing things yeah, about the Dhamma uh, towards the very end of his life. So, um, then uh, Venerable Ananda says, that I've skipped some lines, I can't remember what is in there. Uh, previously, sir, when the mendicants had completed, this, are the, this is Ajahn Sudato's translation for monks and nuns, mendicants had completed the rainy season residence in the various districts. They came to see the realized one. We got to see the esteemed mendicants and to pay homage to them. But when the Buddha has passed away, we won't get to see the esteemed mendicants or to pay homage to them. And then the Buddha replies, Ananda, a faithful person of good family, should go to these four inspiring places. What for? Thinking, here the realized one was born, that is an inspiring place. Thinking, here the realized one became awakened as a supremely fully awakened Buddha, that is an inspiring place. Thinking here the supreme wheel of the Dhamma was rolled forth by the realized one, that is an inspiring place. Thinking here the realized one became fully extinguished through the natural principle of extinguishment without anything left over, in other words, parinibbana, that is an inspiring place. These are the four inspiring places that a faithful person of good family should go to see. So, um, good family is a good translation for Kulaputra. Usually, clansmen is the other translation, but good family is much better here. Anyway, so, so this is why pilgrimage have taken, uh, have start, took place, started to take place very soon after the Buddha passed away. Pilgrimage, and that's why these are the four main holy sites, yeah? because the Buddha says, this is where you should go if you want to be inspired. Uh, and uh, we know that pilgrimage started quite soon after the Buddha, because King Ashoka uh, is one of those people who went on pilgrimage. He actually writes about in one of the famous edicts of King Ashoka. You have heard about the edicts of King Ashoka? Everyone? No? No? Okay. So for those of you who haven't, 
uh, King Ashoka lived about 150 to 200 years after the Buddha. He was the most famous of all the kings of India because he ruled over the largest India that ever existed. It's even larger than India today, probably, because uh, it also included uh, Pakistan and all those areas. It was a very large country at that time, and he ruled over all of this. Uh, and because he was so incredibly powerful, he had all these pillars set up around India. Not just pillars, but also other inscriptions, yeah, inscriptions on rocks and all of these things. And on these inscriptions, uh, he would say things about how he lived and how his practice, and he would give commands to the people of the country here. Yeah. He would tell them to don't kill animals, yeah? All of them nice, not all of them, many of them very nice Buddhist principles uh, that he set out in this edict. So a big column inscribed with words. This was the first let letters or inscriptions found in India, at, uh, ever found in, in India. Um, s yeah, roughly, that's roughly true. Huh? And uh, one of those inscriptions uh, in the, one of these edicts, he talks about going on tour, yeah, going on uh, Dhamma Yatra, it's called there. Uh, Dhamma Yatra means pilgrimage. Uh, so he went on pilgrimage, and he talks about how he went to Lumbini, where the Buddha was born, and all of that. Uh, so we know that pilgrimages to India go back all the way to Ashoka, probably before. Yeah? This is a very ancient tradition that we also follow when we do the same thing. Uh, I have myself been to India, I think, three times at least, uh, uh, on this sort of uh, pilgrimage. So uh, this is what this is about, yeah? so, and this is why it is there. It is there to inspire you, and it can be very inspiring to go to India. As I mentioned before, when you travel to India, sometimes it is like stepping back in time. The feeling that you go to these places and you feel that you there's so many similarities with what India is like now. You get the feeling that you are in the same place. And then you read the signs. What is very strange for me, because I, I know Pali quite well, I can read the signs in India, yeah? Like Uttara Pradesh, yeah? Means Uttara means north, and Pradesh means like place. So it means like the northern place. Yeah, it, and it's almost exactly the same vocabulary you find in the suttas. Uh, and sometimes those place names are pretty much the same as they are in the suttas. You read them, and the suttas, wow, it's the same, <laughs> the same place. Uh, like Benares, Varanasi, is the same in the suttas. Uh. And uh, so this is kind of nice, and you get the feeling for the suttas. It makes them come alive because you realize uh, this is real history. These suttas are not fantasies. Uh, these are things that actually took place uh, because it matches with India in the present day. It's very interesting and very fascinating here. Yeah. So these are the four main places. And remember that they are supposed to be places of inspiration. Remember that. If you ever go to India, remember what the purpose is uh, of the Dhamma tour. Uh, is to inspire you. It's not just to be a tourist yeah, or whatever, but actually it's to try to get some emotion going when you go to these places. Inspiration in English, the word, uh, kind of has this double, fi double meaning of both understanding and emotional uplift at the same time. When you feel inspired, you want to act, you want to do, you have understood something, but you also feel a positive emotion. Yeah? That's what inspiration is. It uh, has this double kind of meaning to it. Uh, and this is what we're trying to do when we go to India. It's almost like we are contemplating the Dhamma, contemplating the Buddha. It's a, it's a kind of Buddha Nusati, or Dhamma Nusati, in a sense, when we go there. Yeah. And uh, remember that these things are so crucial, are such a crucial part of the path of meditation. Uh, in the suttas, when the Buddha talks about uh, uh, any kind of samadhi experience, uh, it always goes through all of these beautiful emotions before you get to samadhi. Sukha, uh, uh, happiness, tranquility, piti, uh, joy, uh, pamuja, gladness, all of these things that go through them. Uh, and one way to give rise to these things, uh, one of the main ways, actually, you know, you have things like sila nusati, recollection of your uh, morality, recollection of generosity, but also the Buddha Nusati, recollection of the Buddha, recollection of the Dhamma. These are core things uh, that are there in the suttas for how to give rise to samadhi. Yeah? We need to have some of that joy in our life, otherwise samadhi cannot really happen. Uh, and this is what this is for. This is to help us uh, g give rise to these positive feelings. Uh, sometimes you go to India, you don't feel anything. Okay, it's okay. You know, we can't force ourselves to feel anything. Uh, but at the very least, you have some idea of the purpose. Uh, 
And uh, if you do feel something, uh, then sometimes you come back afterwards, you come back here to KL, uh, you sit here in the BGF group, you close your eyes, uh, and that feeling comes back to you, uh, yeah, because you have that memory, uh, and then the feeling comes back, and then you can use it in your meditation practice. Uh. So please remember the purpose of these things, uh, because when we remember the purpose, we can act more in an appropriate way. So when you go to an inspiring place, maybe you sit down a little bit, uh, you feel the atmosphere a little bit, yeah? you have maybe someone read a sutta that happened in that place, read a little bit about the history of Buddha, create the right atmosphere, uh, yeah? go at the time when nobody, not everyone else is going. Uh, I had some horror experience going to India when there was, in a, I think it was when I went to Savati, there was a bus, was it, there was a K Korean group with 12 buses, something like that, that came exactly when, I, when we arrived. 350 Koreans, and they, oh, they were, <laughs> and they were very noisy as well. So it, was, it was quite of astonishing. So go out, to be smarter than, than we were, and go at the time when it's quiet. Uh, on the other hand, I had a very good experience going to Rajagaha. We went to the Vulture's Peak, yeah, and you can go there now, you can still see the Vulture's Peak, it still looks a bit like a vulture. We went there first thing in the morning, just before the sun was coming up. Oh, it was so beautiful, uh, absolutely peaceful. Nobody was there except for our group. And we just sat down and we meditated for a while. So nice. Uh, and you can imagine then what it was like to be the Buddha. He would have done the same thing. He would have woken up early on the Vulture Peak. He would have meditated up there. And you get this feeling and it's kind of a, you know, sitting where the Buddha sat is really kind of, it gives you goosebumps when you, when you do that, because uh, it's kind of, <laughs> it's almost scary. Wow, I, am I pretend, what, am I, what are we doing here? Uh, it's, very, it's very powerful and very, very beautiful when you do that. And just below the Vulture Peak, you have the Boar's Cave where the Venerable Sariputta is supposed to have become enlightened, yeah? And all of that. Uh, so it's very uh, evocative of emotion. So try, remember what the purpose is of these things. Yeah, Do it in the right way and then it becomes meaningful for you. Huh? Too many people, they go to India and, this, and they kind of, how was it? Yeah, oh, it was all right, it was polluted. Uh, okay. <laughs> That's part of the deal when you go to India. It is going to be polluted. Yeah? You're going to be coughing. You're going to get probably a little bit sick, at, at the very least, coughing. Yeah? Uh, but uh, don't, don't remember that. Yeah? Let, <laughs> let that go. Remember the other part. That is, that's the purpose of going there. Yeah? Anyway, so that is the four inspiring places. Uh, Faithful monks, nuns, lay men and lay women will come and think, here the realized one was born, here the realized one became awakened as a supreme, fully awakened Buddha, and here the supreme wheel of the Dhamma was rolled forth by the realized one, and here the realized one became fully extinguished through the natural principle of extinguishment without anything left over her. Anyone who passes away on pilgrimage to these shrines, uh, this is Chaitya, the shrine, uh, will, when the body breaks up after death, be reborn in a good place, uh, a heavenly realm. Sounds good, doesn't it? <laughs> uh, and uh, the point here is that if you really feel some of that uh, emotion, that uh, faith and confidence arising, uh, that, of course, then you are, the, the faith and confidence is the opposite of, have, you don't have defilement so much anymore when you have strong faith and confidence. Uh, the defilements fall away. You have, you're quite pure. And because you are quite pure and you die right then, you can imagine that you might go to a heavenly realm. Yeah? Yeah. And this is why sometimes they say in you know, religions like Christianity, they say that all you have to do is to have faith and then you kind of go to God. There's probably something to that, uh, yeah? Because it's sim similar to this idea here, is that when you have really strong faith, you tend to be quite pure. And that purity then makes you perhaps get reborn in a good place, and the Christians will say, well, this is God, this is the eternal good place. Well, we might disagree with that, but that's what... Uh, so you can see that there is maybe some truth to that idea. It's interesting, because when I was young, I kind of dismissed Christianity as superstitious nonsense. That's what kind of, you know, what you do when you're young, you don't really want to have anything to do with this, uh, with this kind of, you know, what you think are silly religions. But then later on you consider some of the things and you think, actually, maybe they have some points anyway. Yeah, it's, not, uh, it's not that I think Christianity is, uh, is uh, you know, is worthwhile uh, being a Christian, anything like that. But some of the points, obviously, are still valid. Uh, yeah, their degrees of morality and this kind of thing. Yeah. So, uh, 
sometimes you come from a different point of view and you understand what is going on here. Okay, let's move on to the next little uh, paragraph uh, and point. Uh, and then we continue on the same theme. It was all about passing away and all about uh, these kind of things. Ananda, these four people uh, are worthy of a monument. Uh, the word for monument, you know what that is? Uh? Stupa, yay, exactly right, well done. So tupa in Pali, yeah? A stupa in Sanskrit. Uh. What for? A realized one, uh, a realized, a perfected one, a fully awakened Buddha. A Buddha awakened for themselves, is a Pacheka Buddha. A disciple of a realized one, usually meaning like a noble person, yeah, an Arya Pugala, and a wheel-turning monarch. These are the four. So these are the four worthy of a stupa. Yeah, okay. A stupa, what, what, first of all, what is a stupa? And uh, w one of the interesting things about stupas is that they have changed enormously over history and they have developed and they have become, uh, you know, they become different. Every era of history has its own kind of stupas. They're always kind of building new and making new things. But the very earliest stupas were very simple. Huh? And to give you an idea of how simple they were in the beginning, uh, there is a Vinaya rule for the monastics that says Natupato Omaditva Pindabatang Bunjisa Mitisikakaraniya, which means I shall not eat my Pindabata, my arms food, uh, having made a stupa. Yeah? <laughs> so a stupa means, in this case, it literally means just a mound. It means like a heap. You're not supposed to make a heap. I don't know if that means you're playing with your food or what it means. I'm not sure what it means. You're not supposed to make a heap of your food. That's a stupa. Tupato omaditva, from a stupa, eating from, from a, a mound. So that's what it meant in the early days. Yeah, it just meant a little heap, a little mound. And uh, so that's what it was. And the Buddha's ashes after the Buddha passed away, and this actually is described right here in the Mahapanibbana Sutta later on, they made stupas for the Buddha. There would have been mounds of earth. Yeah, I don't know, it's, we have no idea how large those mounds were, but they probably weren't that great. And then the, stu the ashes were interred into those mounds of earth. And that was the stupa at the earliest times. And that is why there is no remains of those earliest stupas, because they were just made of natural materials. There were no bricks or anything like that. Bricks only started to be used, bricks and stones only started to be used in India around the time of Ashoka, maybe around 150 years after the Buddha. At the Buddha's time, it was very rare, almost unprecedented, to use bricks and stones in building work. And that is why there are no archaeological remains from that time, apart from large mounds of earth that were used as uh, fortifications and that kind of thing. That's really all you find uh, from the earliest period of, Bud of Buddhism. So th th those were the earliest ones. And then later on, they started to increase the size of the stupa. They started to use bricks. They started to make very large stupas. Uh, and some of the very beautiful early stupas in India are the stupas at Sanchi. Uh. Have you, any of you been to Sanchi uh, in India? Uh? No, nobody's been to Sanchi. Uh. I haven't either, actually. So I, uh, I, I'm, just, uh, you know, I'm just as ignorant as you are, really. But if you see some of the pictures of the early stupas, uh, of Sanchi. You can look it up on the internet. Very, very beautiful, very elaborate. Uh, you have the stupa in the middle and you have the railing going around. You have the big arches, the gateways that you go through. And then you have all the carvings. This is granite. It's carved in granite. Uh, so you have the Jataka stories carved in granite. And you can recognize yeah, just some of the scenes from the life of the Buddha carved in granite. Very, very beautifully done. Uh, so if you want to be a bit touristy, you don't just want to be inspired, then that might be one of the tourist locations worth going. Yeah, Better than going to Paris or something like that. Uh, yeah. <laughs> At least you get some kind of Buddhist input when you go to the, uh, the, uh, these places. Uh. And then after that, stupas developed more. Then you have the stupas that were built in Sri Lanka. Sri Lanka has the largest stupas in the world. Uh, I, I have seen them. Has anyone, else, has anyone here seen the stupas in Sri Lanka? Huh? No? They are absolutely... Oh, over there. Okay, great. They are enormous. Yeah, They are so incredibly large. And they are said to be some of the, 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 the largest man-made structures in the world are the stupas in Sri Lanka. Much larger than the pyramids of Egypt. 
You hear about the pyramids of Egypt, but these things in Sri Lanka are far larger than the pyramids of Egypt. Uh, they are said to contain, uh, some of them, over a billion bricks, and these are really large bricks. Uh, massive, massive structures. Uh. And uh, then, later on, they developed further when Buddhism went to the rest of Asia, when it went to East Asia, yeah, went to China, uh, Korea, Japan, the stupas developed further. And if you go to East Asia now, you travel to, uh, you know, to um, any of these countries, uh, you will see the pagodas. The pagodas of, of East Asia are a further development on the early stupas. Uh, but they look completely different. Yeah, they have like many stories and whatever. They look completely different from the early stupas. But actually, there are a development from that. Uh, and uh, those stories are like the you know, you, uh, on the top of the stupa you have what they call a parasol. That parasol has often seven layers to it. Uh, and then when you look at the pagodas, they are like the parasol, basically, on the top of the, uh, on top of the stupas. Uh. So all of this is part of stupa. Uh, stupa technology and stupa history and stupa uh, um, art, you know, the, the art of stupa making. And this is one of the things that really is a Buddhist thing, that the Buddhists have added to the world history of, um, of buildings is the stupa. There is hardly any stupas outside of Buddhism. There is some stupas that uh, are th are maybe Jain, but nobody really knows for sh sure. Uh, but generally it is a Buddhist thing, the idea of a stupa. This is one of the few uh, buildings that uh, Buddhists have kind of uh, uh, given uh, as a gift to the history of world architecture or whatever it is. Uh, so uh, this is why we, we tend to worship stupa so much in Buddhism. And uh, I'm not sure if that's a good idea, because the Buddha said we shouldn't really worship his remains. Yeah, that's what we're doing. But anyway, that's what we kind of end up doing. So these are the stupas. Just to give you a little bit of background about these monuments. And uh, so four people worthy of the remains of a stupa. And these are these four people just uh, mentioned. And then comes, of course, the question, for what reason is a realized one worthy of a stupa? So that many people will inspire confidence in their hearts, thinking, this is the monument for that blessed one, perfect, perfected and fully awakened one. And having done so, when their body breaks up after death, they are reborn in a good place, in a heavenly realm. It is for this reason that a realized one is worthy of a stupa. So very similar to what we saw about the four shrines, the chaitiyas above, uh, the four places where the special place is, uh, the idea of a, of a stupa is to connect us with the Buddha. Yeah? So you connect them because here you have the bones of the Buddha, so you create a connection with the Buddha. For what reason is the realized one's disciple worthy of a stupa? So many people will inspire confidence in their hearts, thinking this is the monument for that blessed one's disciple. Uh, having done so, when their body breaks up after death, uh, they are reborn in a good place, a heavenly realm. It is for this reason that a realized one's disciple is worthy of a stupa. I read this out for the monks at Bodhinyana Monastery recently, uh, and I asked them, does this mean that we have to make a stupa for Ajahn Brahm when he passes away? Uh, is, this what we, is, that, is that what it means? Uh, and the, the monks weren't sure, they, weren't, they were kind of, uh, they were dithering a little bit. Uh, what, what do you think? Does that mean that we should, should we make a stupa of Ajahn Brahm when he passes away, or should we not make a stupa of Ajahn Brahm when he passes away? <laughs> this is what it seems to be saying, yeah, if someone really has practiced the path fully, that's what it seems to be saying here, a disciple of the Buddha would normally mean a noble disciple. Uh, so if you think someone is a noble disciple, you should be a stupa. So maybe, you know, maybe down the track, those of you who are the youngest, youngest here, huh? who is the youngest person here? Huh? Not sure, huh? maybe one day, you are you the youngest person here? Huh? <laughs> okay, maybe one of these, that one day you will come down to, have you been to Perth before? Huh? You haven't been to Perth before, okay. So maybe when you come to Perth, there will be a stupa there. Ajahn Brahm might be gone, but there will be a stupa there instead. Huh? <laughs> maybe you should try to come before, you can see both before and after, yeah, this is even, even better here. Huh? But it's interesting, yeah, when you read these things, you start to think, yeah, okay, interesting. But um, probably those stupas should, shouldn't really be built by monks anyway, probably. It uh, should probably be left to the, uh, to the lay people if they feel like doing it. Uh, anyway. Uh, yeah, so the, all the four people have been mentioned because of all the dots there. 
Uh, then, uh, so I have left out some more bits and pieces. And then we come to the uh, next one. But um, I think let us have a little bit of a break there because I've been going on for about an hour already. And then we can come down and do the last part in 15 minutes or so. Okay.